Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of The Big Conversation Season 3. I'd love to know what you think of Sabina and Luke's dialogue by filling out a brief survey. It's multi-choice and really quick. You can also receive bonus video content and updates from the series by subscribing to our newsletter at thebigconversation.show. For the survey and the bonus content, check out the links in the info. Hello and welcome along to The Big Conversation from Unbelievable, brought to you in partnership with the John Templeton Foundation. I'm Justin Briley and The Big Conversation is all about exploring the biggest questions of science, faith and philosophy with some of the leading thinkers from the religious and non-religious world. Today we're talking about the fine-tuning of the universe and was the cosmos created for us? This season is being recorded remotely for obvious reasons, but the silver lining is that it does allow us to bring fascinating voices together from around the world. And joining me today are Luke Barnes and Sabina Hossenfelder. Uh, Luke Barnes is an astrophysicist researching galaxy formation and dark energy at Western Sydney University. He's a co-author of books including A Fortunate Universe, Life in a Finely Tuned Cosmos, and believes that fine tuning provides evidence that life was indeed intended by a creator. Sabina Hossenfelder is a theoretical physicist researching dark matter at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies, and she's the author of Lost in Math, How Beauty Leads Physics Astray. She doesn't believe the universe is fine-tuned for life or that God's existence can be hypothesized from science. Uh, Such a treat to have you both on the programme with me today, Sabina and Luke. Thank you for joining me. Uh, Let's start with you, Sabina. Um, uh, How did you get involved in this particular area of science? And tell us a little bit about your interests because you don't only produce great videos on your YouTube channel explaining scientific concepts. You even do music videos and things. So so tell us a little about yourself, first of all. Yeah, so how did I get into this? I originally studied mathematics and uh, it turned out I was more interested by the question, how much can we learn from mathematics about the world? Uh, then by figuring out exactly, you know, what, how mathematical structures themselves behave. So naturally, I ended up being uh, in physics, mostly in the foundations of physics, um, researching this question, how much can we learn about the world uh, using mathematics? And I worked for a little bit on quantum gravity, um, high energy particle physics. Now I do more um, astrophysics, as you just said. I also do a little bit foundations of quantum mechanics, so all that kind of stuff where mathematics is really <laughs> the whole game, basically. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of uh, interest related to this. I have an interest in the philosophy of physics. It's kind of <laughs> very close by this whole research area. And as you said, I, you know, I guess I have a, <laughs> a creative urge. <laughs> so I, every once in a while, I sing. <laughs> It's it's fun. Uh, I've really enjoyed watching some of your videos. Um, what about faith, Sabina? Uh, has um, belief in God or any kind of faith ever figured in your life or, or not really? Well, um, so I've grown up in Germany and uh, uh, most people here are a Christian, um, either a Roman Catholic or a Protestant. Uh, my husband's whole fam- family is um, uh, Catholic. Um, but I've, I've grown up, um, an atheist, uh, and, um, uh, I've also never been Christianized. And, uh, I, for some while, I considered attending church. I, so I attended mass for some time and I liked the singing, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't really identify with it. So, uh, I would say that, uh, for what my profession, professional scientist is concerned, uh, I would identify as agnostic. Uh, I, I don't really have uh, an opinion about it either way. But if you ask about the way that I live my life in practice, uh, I don't belong to any religion. I don't attend church. Sure. When you when you look at the night sky or some of the extraordinary things about our universe, does, does it ever inspire anything like religious awe in you? Or would you describe it a different way? I would say I don't really know what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> so I guess that, that means the answer is uh, no. I mean, I find it totally amazing. You know, I like to think about what's going uh, on out there. And uh, it always still blows my mind. You know, if you try to imagine sure. the, the, the size of the cosmos and all the stuff that's in there. Mm. Uh, but I don't associate any anything religious with it. 
Okay, well, maybe we'll return to some of those sorts of questions uh, later on in the, the show. But I'm really looking forward to unpacking some of the science behind this as well. Uh, and with Luke, of course, our other guest on the show today. Uh, Luke, a bit of background to yourself. Um, how did you end up uh, researching uh, dark matter and multiverses and all the interesting stuff you do? And, and of course, the fine tuning of the universe for life. How, how did you come into that particular field? Well, I mean, well, I started off as a more respectable astrophysicist, just doing things like how <laughs> galaxies form. Cosmology was always uh, an interest. I mean, I grew up as a bit of a dinosaur nerd, but uh, but again, through maths, just wanted to realize this was a way to understand the world. Uh, but I had heard about this sort of field of fine tuning, books by um, you know Barrow and Tipler and 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 Paul Davis and and a bunch of other people, and so just started reading. The scientific literature on this and, and got fascinated in it and then sort of realized there were ways to contribute to that field by looking at uh, various ways that um, uh, life depends on the fundamental constants of nature. Brilliant. Um, tell me about your own faith commitments. I mean, and do they at any level sort of impact the science that you do? So I'm, I'm a Christian. Uh, I grew up in a Christian household and uh, sort of towards the end of teenage years, um, obviously an interest in science. Uh, there's a whole lot of people who, you know, were saying that, you know, these two things couldn't be held together. So I started reading a whole bunch of stuff by uh, atheists. There's a whole bunch of Dawkins behind me and, and such. Uh, and at the end of that, still had my faith. I still go to church and all those sorts of things. Um, it... I mean, it inspires me to to investigate the world because the world's an amazing place and for me an amazing creation. So, uh, but beyond that, um, you know, apart from a, a very deep belief that the the universe is a, ultimately a rational place, um, uh, beyond that, science and and you know, science is really just sort of the world. Uh, my Christian faith is really the worldview in which I do science, rather than anything that specifically turns up in a theory i never i never answered god on any of my physics exams um well it's great to have you both on the show today thank you very much uh, for joining me um maybe we should start with a, an explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe itself obviously we're, we're going to try and keep this accessible for lay people um uh, luke in a way in a way you're you're making the argument uh, for this phenomenon today so why don't you begin and explain uh, as simply as you can, what the fine tuning of the universe for life is, and maybe with an example or two of some of these particular constants and parameters that appear to be finely tuned for for life to develop in the cosmos. Right. So roughly, when we say fine tuned, it's a bit like the way we use it in everyday life. It doesn't necessarily mean a fine tuner. It just means that there's some sort of that an explanation requires a suspiciously precise assumption in order to work, uh, and so. Specifically, when we look at the ultimate, uh, sort of the deepest laws of nature we currently have, the standard models, um, there are these numbers in them, and for whatever reason, mischievousness or curiosity, we we can think about what would happen if those numbers were different. What would happen if the if you know there was a universe, and when you describe these universe in laws, there was the same laws as ours, but these numbers were different. And he, there's there's numbers like the cosmological constant. Um, which is a, a sort of an, an accelerating influence on space or a decelerating influence on space, to, to put it roughly. Uh, there's a sort of range that this number could have in our theories between what are called the Planck limits of if we wanted to go outside of those limits, we need a quantum theory of gravity when we don't really have a successful one of those at the moment. Uh, but within those limits, um, almost... All of the universes are kind of disastrous. So, if if it were if the uh, number is too large and positive, the universe expands so fast that no structure forms, no protons ever sort of get together into into nuclei or anything. If it's too negative, then um, the universe recollapses in less than a second or something. And within the total range, the 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 limits that avoid those two sort of catastrophes. Is sort of one part in about even very conservatively ten to the ninety at most. Um, we can also talk about the sort of typical scale of the particles of the masses of the particles we're made of. There's some, a number called the Higgs vacuum expectation value. 
Uh, it has a certain value in our universe. It could, in the equations, go between zero and, again, this Planck limit. And on that scale, uh, you've got to, again, you've got to land between uh, the numbers are 6 times 10 to the minus 18 and three about 3 times 10 to the minus 17. So, you know, 6 times 1 over and then 18 zeros on the bottom there. These are the sort of numbers. And if you're on one side of that range, then a free hydrogen atom can just eat its electron and turn into a neutron. So you get a pure neutron universe uh, in which structure won't form. And if you're on the other side, then you can't stick any of the fundamental bits of the universe together to make nuclei. And again, you get a pretty disastrous kind of boring universe. Um, there's also the strengths of the forces, the, fi the uh, fine structure constant, for example. It, it in our universe is about 7 over 1,000. If it was 18 over 1,000, then you'd get the neutron universe again. The proton would be heavier than the neutron. It would decay into the neutron. You wouldn't get, you know, free hydrogen in the universe. And so these seem like pretty disastrous things, outcomes, and in particular, it seems like the complexity that any form, conceivable form of life would need would not exist in those universes. Those universes are remarkably simple. And so, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of other cases just to plug the book. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's a whole bunch of them in here. Uh, the first author is Geraint Lewis, a colleague of mine at the University of Sydney, who's also an atheist. So we agree about the science, and then in the last chapter, we disagree about what it means. Okay. But certainly, that's, that's a, yeah. some example. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. And, and the point being here, that the, if these, uh, you know, particular values and constants differed, even by a tiny, tiny fraction from their actual given value, uh, we would not have a universe that could support life. Now, that's not to say that life would necessarily develop in such a universe, but you wouldn't have, for example, just the basic chemistry needed to enable life at some point to get going in the universe. That, that's the way I understand it, Luke. Yeah, roughly. It, it's not that if we think about all the possibilities, it's not that our point is uniquely able to support life. Uh, it's just that the bits that are able to support the complexity needed by life are very small pieces of of the total so there might be another small bit el bits or elsewhere but they're not you, you don't hit it let's say you don't hit them at random but that's sort of assuming the <laughs> the result uh but yeah they're very just a very small part of the overall thank you very much um okay sabina let, let's come to you um because you've um i know interacted with this argument before and you're skeptical from the very outset that there really is such a thing as the fine tuning of the universe so so tell us where you begin with all of this well it it starts with uh what luke said at the very beginning that these types of fine-tuning arguments are similar to the types of fine-tuning that we observe in everyday life. They're just not. Uh, so the typical example that people like to bring up for fine-tuning is a pencil uh, balanced on its tip. Um, so we wouldn't normally observe that in everyday life. It's a highly unstable situation. Um, if we saw something like that, we would expect an explanation. You know, there's something holding that pen in position, uh, whatever. So, so the point is that we come to this conclusion. It's unlikely it requires an explanation, right? Um, but how do we know that? Well, we know that th there are other positions that a pencil can be in that are much more likely. Uh, and the reason um, we say it's much more likely is because we have observed it many times. So we have observational evidence. Now, when we're talking about the values of the constants in um, the concordance model or the standard model of particle physics or whatever it is, like these examples that Luke was just talking about, we can't change these constants. They have one value for all we currently know, you know, that there are variations of these models where people consider that the constants may actually vary with space and time, but that's a different story entirely. So for the models that Luke would, was just talking about, they, they are constants, as the name says, and we can't change them. There's no physical process that will change these constants. Now, one can make a purely theoretical observation um, of the type that Luke was talking about, you know, as a hypothetical question. You can say, well, what would a universe look like if I were to change this constant this way or some other way? And lots of people have done that and there have been books written about it. And, and, and that's all fine with me. 
but it's it's not a scientific claim to say there's something in need of an explanation here because these are not examples that we can ever observe. Um, so we don't know anything about the probability of that ever happening. Okay, so so essentially, you're just not convinced that we could know that these constants and values could take a different value. And therefore, we don't know what the probability is of them taking a different value. Therefore, all we have is the one example we do have in our universe of the values they do take, which do happen to support life in the universe. Um, I know that you're very critical, not just of those who use fine tuning as an argument for God, but even for a multiverse, which which is a relatively popular, as I see it, uh, principle in physics a lot of people seem to be you know engaging with that idea but 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 you're quite critical of that aren't you well the multiverse is not a principle uh, it's a hypothesis uh, and it's not a scientific hypothesis um, and yeah i mean it's a little bit more complicated the the fine-tuning argument is not the only argument that people bring up in favor of the multiverse but it, it's certainly one of them uh, and yeah, it's kind of similar. So, so people are saying, well, we do observe these constants of nature. Uh, that's arguably correct. <laughs> uh, and then they say, well, we want to have an explanation for that. Like, why do the values have the values that they have? And that's fine with me. You know, that's what science is all about. You want, you want an explanation. Then they say, well, the, the multiverse is this explanation. And that's there where my problem begins because it doesn't explain anything in the in the scientific sense it doesn't explain anything and um why do they think it explains something is because they've constructed a problem which is unscientific to begin with which, which is this uh fine tuning argument there's just as you as you summarize it correctly um we we can't change these constants therefore we don't know anything about the probability of that ever happening so there's nothing in need of an explanation OK, I, I think this will be a key difference between you here then, Luke. Um, what's what's your response to this idea that, well, we don't know that they could take a different value. Therefore, we just can't assign any probability to, to their being unusual in that sense. Yeah. So the, the idea that the only way that you get probabilities or that you can know probabilities is by observing um, a large number of things, you know, data, that, that's an interpretation of probabilities known as frequentism, which is uh, Sabina's outline in one of her videos. And it's, it's not, I don't think it's an interpretation of probability that a lot of scientists subscribe to. The alternative is something called, well, there's a number of alternatives, uh, but one of them is called Bayesianism. And I did a quick check on the NASA publication database. There are currently over 11,000 papers with the word Bayesian in the title. Um, there are 79 papers with the word frequentist in the title or frequentism, and half of those also have the word Bayesian in the title. So um, the whole point of trying to, let me try and lay out what this, this word means. Um, for a Bayesian, you can interpret probabilities to mean D degrees of support, the idea that one statement supports another statement. So there are dark clouds overhead, supports the statement that it will be raining 10 minutes from now. Um, now, you can also support that with data, of course, but it's not that that statement is a, you know, that's a statement is not a statement about the data we've already observed. It's a statement about how, how different um, you know, propositions support each other. And once you've done that, I mean, the fact that you can't run the fine tuning argument on frequentism is, uh, yeah, of course, like every, <laughs> every paper on the fine tuning argument start, you know, mentions that at some point. It, it's all run via what are called, via these sort of Bayesian or epistemic probabilities, and they are widely used in physics. So there's a, a major, um, statement there that needs to be supported. I mean, there's there's discussions of Bayesianism in uh, that that Sabina's brought up in 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 her various publications, but all I'd, I'd want to say is that to say that we can't observe other values of the constants, therefore there's no sense in talking about their probability, it, uh, assumes an interpretation of probability that is not shared. That at, l at the very least, uh, there's a vast vast number of scientists, of physicists, of statisticians who who wouldn't sign up to that. It's called finite frequentism. And and I, th I think it's a complete non-starter. 
Sabina. Well, yes, of course, I'm aware that there are different ways of interpreting inter interpreting uh, probabilities. Um, I actually, when I made this argument, I uh, did not say that um, we need to have uh, the only way to speak about the probabilities is to have observational evidence uh, of <clears throat> these other values. There are certainly other ways that you can go about it, but in the end, they all go back to evidence. Like if I think of this balanced pencil again, uh, you don't necessarily need to sample uh, a lot of instances of pencils in, in one or the other orientation. You can also just use a physical theory about what you have learned about, you know, the air or the surface that it's standing on and the kind of vibrations, distortions, um, uh, that can occur. And you would, you would again come to the conclusion that it's, it's, it's very unlikely to observe a pencil balance on its tip. And you can interpret this, uh, in a Bayesian way. It's like, it's not the expectation. Uh, you would have on that observation. But again, that's an argument you can't make for the constants of nature. There, there are no physical processes that could change these constants of nature because they're constant. And if you go by the expectation that we have uh, from the observations that we have made, your expectation is, of course, the next time you measure, you know, alpha, it will have the same value that it had before. Uh, so uh, again, I, I don't know what you, what you're talking about, Luke, Luke. I mean, is there is there any in principle reason why you couldn't the, these values couldn't take a difference? I mean, are you saying that yes, of course they do take the value they take in our universe, um, but you don't see any reason why they couldn't pot potentially be different from the values they they do hold? Yeah, so maybe it'll help if we just sort of step back a bit. Um, we this, this is all happening in the context of, of some very fundamental questions about the universe. So if we're, we're talking about the fine-tuning argument, I take the fine-tuning argument to be a sort of an extension of, of a very basic, it's not even an argument, it's just kind of an instinct. You know, why do most people who have ever lived and still live believe that there's a God? Well, one of the reasons might be if you look around at the universe and there are various bits and pieces of it that seem to fit well together in a way that you might think, you know, needs a mind, uh, and that, that's a very sort of basic way of of putting putting the world together and seeing if it if that makes sense of it. And it seems that it does make sense of it. There's there's various things around us that seem like that. So the question is now, what happens when science starts to to inform the way that we actually understand the world? Well, at, on a on a first level, finding that the world is more um, intricately put together than our first observations show seems to strengthen that intuition. If you think a hummingbird is amazing, then zooming out and seeing the whole of an ecosystem or looking back in time at the processes that brought the hummingbird into existence or zooming in on the sort of the, the biological details of a hummingbird, all of that is just more amazing stuff. And so if you want to try and make this sort of instinct really secure, you might say, okay, Let's go as deep as we can and try to work out whether the universe that we see is the sort of place that looks kind of thrown together at random, you know, Bertrand Russell saying we're all accidental collocations of atoms, or whether there is something remarkable about the way the universe is at its most fundamental level. And what fine tuning suggests is there's a, there's a systematic way of, of doing this. Why don't we go to the, the fundamental laws of nature and when we look at those uh, there are these numbers that you just have to put in that the, 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 the equation doesn't give you. Why don't we systematically change those as much as we can and try and work out what would happen and see if there was, if, if there is something remarkable about the way the universe is, as opposed to ways the universe could have been. So the fact that there aren't, it, that's a counterfactual statement, other things the way the universe could have been. So I think in that context, what fine tuning is trying to do, it's trying to answer that question, is there anything remarkable about the way the universe is rather than the ways that it could have been but isn't? And a systematic way of looking through those is, is let's change these constants. And when you do that, um, these other possibilities are just kind of, as best we know, possibilities. 
I mean, if you've got some idea about why it's it's metaphysically necessary or logically necessary, why the universe has to be like this, then then publish it. But in the absence of that, let's at least look at these other possibilities, see if there's something remarkable about our universe. And into that, what the Bayesian approach is giving is to say that we can take our uncertainty about why things are the way they are, and that is enough to generate a probability distribution. Yes, I can get them from data, frequentism. I can get them from scientific models. That's um, objective chances. There's various ways of that. That's another interpretation of probability. Yes, I can get them that way. I can also get them from uncertainty. I mean, this is what probabilities is, are supposed to do. The fact that um, I, you know, there is uncertainty in, if, if I just sort of look at the world trying to look at it blankly and say, okay, what are some other ways it could have been? And I don't know why it's this way rather than another way. That that uncertainty under certain conditions can be quantified into a probability. We'll, we'll get your response to that in a moment's time, Sabina. I'm just going to go to a quick break. And, uh, and then uh, I'd love to open up this question of whether you do think it's remarkable in any case that the universe does happen to take the values it takes um, or whether, you know, the fact that we're here to observe it you know, just is, you know, one of those things. Uh, it couldn't be the other than it is. Um, we're talking about the fine tuning of the universe today here on The Big Conversation from Unbelievable. I'm Justin Briley and joined today by Luke Barnes and Sabina Hossenfelder. Hi again. Hope you're enjoying the show. Just a reminder that I'd love to hear what you think of the show in our brief survey. We've also got some great bonus content for newsletter subscribers at thebigconversation.show. Register there. You'll be the first to hear about future conversations and exclusive resources from the show. Links for the survey and bonus videos are all with today's video. Welcome back to this week's edition of The Big Conversation from Unbelievable. I'm Justin Briley. My guests today are Luke Barnes and Sabina Hossenfelder. We're talking about the fine tuning of the universe. Uh, where's the cosmos made for us? And um, just in that last section, Sabina, uh, we heard Luke describing the ways in which he believes it, it is valid to to look at the constants and values of the fundamental forces in the universe and to see that there is, uh, they do require an explanation for why they take the value they take that, that involves us. I mean, a common response to this has been something sometimes called the weak anthropic principle um, as an objection to this, which is that, well, look, it's hardly surprising that we observe a universe which has the kinds of qualities that can uh, sustain us because we wouldn't be here to observe it. Otherwise, um, it's a kind of, what else would you expect to see? I mean, do you find that a, a a sufficient sort of explanation for why we find ourselves in this universe that, of course, it's going to have the values that support us, Sabina? Well, that depends very much on what you mean by sufficient explanation. Now, the, the anthropic principle, I think, has been a little bit abused by some people. To me, it's just... Uh, it's an observational constraint on our parameters. Uh, I, I don't know what's different about the observation that we exist, like we're here and we're talking. Uh, that seems like a true observation. Uh, and uh, that's only possible if the constants of nature are within certain parameter ranges that allow for the existence of life. And that's just correct. Um, now, when one can debate how useful this constraint is in practice. Uh, I would say it has limited use, but it's there's nothing unscientific about it. Now, um, does that explain the values of the constants per se? Not it explains certain constraints on them, uh, as I just said. Um, but to come to your question, like, is there something in need of an explanation? Well, when it comes to purely the values of these constants, taking into account the observational constraints that we have? Um, the answer is no. Now, then you can ask, is, is the other theories that we have right now, are they a satisfactory explanation? Are they a sufficient explanation? And I think that's just a very, you know, a very personal question. Um, some people would say, well, the theories that we have are sufficient. Uh, they're fine as an explanation. And other people might go and ask for some kind of a deeper explanation, maybe. And I would just say, well, that that's leaving uh, the scientific territory. 
and in that sense then when you kind of look at your existence in the universe you don't think this is highly un- unlikely or remarkable um you just take it as a as, as a given that that the universe has produced you that's right i don't think this is uh unlikely because i have no way to say anything about this probability okay luke what's your response to this particular way of, of saying yeah there, there isn't an issue to be debated here because what else would you be expecting uh you know you're looking at a universe that produced you uh, it's bound to have the kind of uh fundamental physics that that allows that well i think sabina's point is slightly different from the the anthropic principle her video on this is is quite good actually um which is refreshing there's a whole lot of nonsense about the anthropic principle going around um so uh, I th- the point the crucial point there was that uh the values of these constants uh are, are not calling out for an explanation and so i think there is a general case to say that they are so if you take say uh popper's uh, 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 popper's account of of what what what's a a good criterion, say a necessary, maybe sufficient, depends who you ask, criterion for for an idea to be a scientific idea, well, it, it's got to be falsifiable. There's got to be some set of observations um, that we could make uh, where we'd say, all right, well, we saw this and so that idea is definitely wrong. One of the ways to avoid being falsified is to make your idea very flexible. Um, and so if you make an idea very flexible so that it can explain a whole range of things, depending on its own internal, you know, um, cogs and wheels, the problem is it won't explain the data. It will simply accommodate the data. Now, free parameters in any theory are, are assumptions. Those are f- flexibility in the theory. The standard model of particle physics has 25 of them. Okay. So those in and of themselves our flexibility in the theory. And if we could get behind that to a theory that removes some of that flexibility, that would be a better thing. And I don't think there's much disagreement with Sabina, but then what that, about that, but then um, what you would not accept is if someone said, I've got a better theory that explains the value of the constant, um, someone saying, oh no, I can just generate, I can just say that the constant is what it is and there's nothing to explain. Um, if, if there's nothing to explain, then how can there be a better explanation? That That's my confusion with Sabina's position here. Go ahead, Sabina. So the theories that we presently use work just fine. I think we agree on that. Um, so they definitely explain a huge lot of data, uh, both out there in the cosmos and when it comes to uh, particle physics. And I yet have to see a better theory. <laughs> Let me put it that way. So these theories are de facto the best explanations that we currently have. Is it possible that there are better explanations than that from which we can maybe one day calculate several of these constants or they turn out to be related in some way? Certainly, you know, I, I don't have an issue uh, with that. But there's nothing right now from which I would say that actually requires such an explanation. Um, for all we presently know, these constants may just have the values that they have, period. And that's it. And that's just the best explanation that there is. Yeah. Why does that explanation not satisfy you then, Luke? Uh, I'm trying to get to the core of, of why you think that they, we do need a better explanation than just these are the constants we have and that's enough. Yeah. Again, it it. How do, how do I want to put this? I, again, I, I get back to Popper's point about flexible theories. So, any any. Think about a sort of a mathematician, and and they lay out the axioms of here's where I'm going to start from, and then I'm going to try and prove some stuff. If someone could could come come along and say, okay, see your starting point. Hey, I could take one of those off this list, that list, and still prove everything that you've proved, we would go with that second simpler option. So part of what makes a better explanation is that it has fewer assumptions. Now, just counting assumptions is a bit of a a rough idea. What what we want to be actually more precise about that, and I think the Bayesian approach gives us that precision. So what what I want to say is that a free parameter in a theory is a degree of flexibility that a deeper theory might not have 
And in that case, the deeper theory would win. So wherever you've got one of these constants, you've got a sort of opportunity there. There's a wonderful quote from Richard Feynman basically saying everyone, every physicist should put the fine structure constant, 1 over 137 roughly, up on their wall and worry about it. And this was his point. It's, it's, this, it's an assumption. And if we could do better and not have to make an assumption and still explain all the data, that would be great. What this, the way this comes back around to the fine-tuning argument is um, not that I'm ruling out deeper theories, not that I think that God is going to be the deeper explanation of that. No, we keep doing science, right? I'm a scientist. I'm not saying we stop science now and we all go to church. The point of the fine-tuning argument is if we're trying to look around at other ways the universe could have been, this fact about the deepest laws that we know now tells us that there is something remarkable about this universe all the way down to the bottom. Your amazement at seeing a, a hummingbird goes all the way down. You should be amazed at the values of the, co of the uh, fundamental constants of nature for, for the same sorts of reasons. I mean, coming back to you, Sabina, I mean, one one of the earliest people to sort of make a comment on this phenomenon of fine tuning was Fred Hoyle, you know, well known British uh, physicist, and and he discovered, well, he he predicted a certain resonance, and you'll have to tell me the scientific aspect of this to get this right, um, but but uh, in carbon, which um, would allow, which would make sense of us being able to be here, of life being able to exist in the universe. Now, his famous phrase on that was that um, to all intents and purposes, it looks like something or someone has monkeyed with physics and there are no blind forces uh, worth speaking of in nature. Um, he obviously felt that there was something that needed an explanation here. Um, could you first of all explain what Fred Hoyle was was describing there, what he had discovered and, and why he thought it, it made it look as though though he didn't necessarily follow it to Luke's conclusions, obviously, but why it made it look as though there was this, this fine-tuning going on. Give us the, the specific example from, from the science, first of all. Well, yeah, goodness, you're putting me on the spot there. So <laughs> I, I, can't, I, I, I can't recall exactly how this argument goes, but it's roughly speaking something of the type that uh, if, for nuclear fusion to continue in stars the way that we observe it, there needs to be specific structure about the carbon nucleus and uh, which was not known at the time but how said it has to be there otherwise it doesn't work and it was later actually uh, observed so it, this uh, prediction turned out to be correct um so look please correct me if i got this entirely wrong i, I think that's that's yeah as, uh, that's, that's as good, good yeah. as i can remember <laughs> Uh, uh, and so I, I would say that that's an example of using the weak anthropic principle. You know, he just he made this observation like stars burn. We are here. Um, there has to be something in this nuclear fusion cycle that allows for this. Uh, and that that led him um, to to this conclusion. That's a fine scientific argument. Now, as for um, his feeling that there's something in need of being explaining or that looks as there's something remarkable here that requires an explanation, I, I don't know what to do with these statements. You know, they're not, they're not scientific statements. I, I don't think they're warranted uh, from a scientific uh, perspective. Now, you know, I, if people feel that way, that's certainly fine with me. But from a purely observational point of view, uh, I don't think we have any reason um, why there has to be this deeper explanation. And, and let me say again, you know, it, I, I would be super excited if there was one. Like, you know, if someone comes up tomorrow and says, yeah, look, I can calculate all, you know, all 26 parameters or something of the standard model, uh, using a much simpler equation, you know, I would be super excited because I would be convinced that there will certainly be uh, more insights falling out of this. Uh, but for all we currently know, um, it, it just doesn't have to be the case. I, I guess I'm interested in teasing out this particular example, Luke, because I often think it, it helps to to have a sort of specific example in uh, in front of us. But th this idea that that Hoyle predicted that the the I think it's something like the resonance of the carbon atom or something would have to take a very very specific value in order uh, to to allow the fusion that would obviously enable us to exist as carbon-based creatures and so on. Um, uh, he, he felt there was something curious uh, that needed explaining at the heart of that, um, though, as I say, didn't, he didn't end up becoming a theist or anything like that. What, what's, explain that example to us and, and what your, <laughs> why you believe 
those kinds of examples do require an explanation beyond themselves in a sense. Well, I, I can't do much better explaining the physics in Sabina without you know, <laughs> doing a whole lot of maths. Uh, but the, the, the basic idea is, is there. Um, you're trying to smash two things together to make three things, in fact, together to make carbon. Um, and it, it uh, given the physics known to Hoyle at the time, it simply wasn't going to work in large stars unless there was a bit of physics missing. This, this way that carbon can wobble around, you know, oscillate um, and resonate uh, in a certain way. Um, so why, do I, why is this? So the reason I think why um, this affected Hoyle was just that basically the thought, uh, you know, as follows. There's a, a wonderful quote from Dawkins, I think it must be behind me somewhere, where he basically says, you know, however many ways there are to be alive, it is certain that there are vastly more ways to be dead, or rather not alive. And he takes the example of if you take two grams of matter uh, and you arrange it, most of those arrangements won't fly or reproduce or do anything like that. So there's this this thought of, um, you know, what do you expect if if there's no deeper explanation of the world we see around us? Is 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 that you wouldn't expect there to be any sort of uh, unlikely? Uh, there's that word again. Sort of remarkable, interesting, you know, you know, uh, conspiracies that have to come together in order for us to exist. We just have to be, as Russell said, accidental collocations of atom, atom, atoms. So to find that our existence depends on a what seems like a very unlikely. A thing to turn up in a carbon atom that's uh that that again that that overturns some of, of the way that Hoyle thought about the world I should say and I have to put in this little this is the sort of asterisk that basically me and about four other people care about um Fred Adams has done some interesting work in looking at exactly how fine-tuned this case is there's a sort of back way around that you can you can for the experts you can bind beryllium is another way of getting... Anyway, it's not quite as fine-tuned as Hoyle thought it was, but there still are good examples yes, of fine-tuning. Yes. Uh, let me put yeah. that asterisk Well, well we, we could talk about other examples, obviously, that, that maybe have a firmer foundation in that sense. I, I suppose where this leads me all, as a, as a layperson here, Sabina, um, uh, is um, I, I, can't, I understand where you're coming from, I think, the idea that, look, the we don't know if these values and the laws of physics could have taken different forms and so on. Therefore, it's a pointless question to be asking. But I still get left with that nagging question of why a universe that produces us, uh, that can produce life, um, it, it still seems like um, even if the laws somehow, there was some uh, mechanism that meant that all the, the physical parameters had to take the value they take. It still seems remarkable that they took those values and produced us. It, it, it just seems like, to me at least, it still feels like it needs an explanation. Um, it, it's like, what's the, the principle that caused every, all of the laws to take the exact values that, that they were, even, even if they couldn't have been different from they were, it still feels like we still need to understand why they've taken that value does that make sense it's otherwise you're just sort of saying it's a brute fact almost that they are they take the value they take as though that doesn't need explaining does that does that make sense to you sabina well as i've said a few times um w what you think needs explaining is not necessarily a scientific question i would say from the scientific perspective it does not currently need explaining you know, the universe has to be some way, and it's the way that we observe. That's just a fact. And I think uh, that the task of science is to come up with the best explanations for these observations as, as well as we can do. And I mean explanation here in, um, especially in physics, it, in a purely quantitative way. You know, we have these theories uh, and they, yes, they come with some parameters, but of course the parameters are not the only assumptions. There are lots of other assumptions that also go into these theories. Uh, like, uh, I don't know, space-time is a three plus one dimensional uh, Riemannian manifold <laughs> with a differentiable structure and so on and so forth, all that kind of stuff. And we use these theories um, to calculate um, 
observations, you know, the, the measurement results uh, for our observations. And we do as best as we can. Uh, and for me, that's what science is all about. And uh, as I've said a few times, you can certainly wish there is an underlying theory and maybe there is one, but maybe there just isn't one. You know, may maybe that's just the best that we can do. Do, do, do you, so do you think the question, why is there even a universe? Why is there a, you know, a set of physical laws that take the value they do? Is that not a science question? Is that not a question that, that you're in a position to, to be asking? Is it a question that another person could ask, a philosopher, a theologian? Um, I mean, I suppose I'm, I'm coming to sort of the, uh, you know, to that really metaphysical point of saying science obviously looks at the physical universe and we can make hypotheses and, and look at the data and, and, you know, make predictions and so on. But the question of, why is there a universe with physical laws uh, and does that itself need an explanation? You feel that that goes beyond the purview of science in your view? Yes, actually. So I, I wouldn't even know how to formally phrase uh, the question that, that you just posed. Uh, but uh, e even the question that Luke uh, puts forward, like about the fine tuning, um, I would I would already say that this uh, is not a scientific question. Uh, it, it's just not a question that uh, we know how to address uh, with science. And uh, you can certainly uh, ask for an explanation, but it won't be a scientific ex explanation. So my issue with this whole fine tuning argument, and by the way, this isn't only something that comes up in, in cosmology and astrophysics. Uh, um, particle physicists also use very similar arguments, uh, though they phrase them a little bit differently. So it's not uh, exactly the same story, but a very, very uh, similar ones. Um, that's just a conflation between scientific reasoning and, um, you know, you, you can call it philosophical reasoning or maybe uh, religious uh, reasoning, depending on what side you're, you're on. Sure. Luke, what, do you think it's a legitimate scientific question to ask, where do the laws come from? Where does the universe come from to kind of, I suppose, go beyond the, the basic fact of physical reality to ask, does physical reality need an explanation? Well, let me shock the audience and say, no, <laughs> it's a philosophical, it's a philosophical question. It's not a scientific question. I, I totally agree with that. Um, if, if you think that the only good questions are scientific questions, then you, you'll think that these aren't good questions. I'd, I'd want to know why you think that. And the problem is, if you, if you think you have a good answer to the question, why, uh, you know, why are all good questions scientific questions? That's going to be a philosophical answer because it's a philosophical question. Anyway, um, the point I make, so I, I don't want to replace science with God, right? This, this is not the point. Um, we'll keep doing science because, of course, we will. Oh, I, I will. You know, I want to know how this whole place works. The point of this is... I think the the way I'd want to phrase this, I don't actually like the phrase um, um, demands an explanation or needs an explanation. I think it's it's what matters is the possibility of a better explanation. That's all that's all we have. And uh, an explanation with fewer assumptions is a better explanation. The constants are assumptions, and so off we go. In terms of of the fine tuning argument. What we're trying to think of is, 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 you know, imagine we got, imagine, imagine this is it. And actually for, um, uh, um, most people don't, I think most physicists would not accept that, um, that, you know, maybe this is just the way the universe is. That would, that would be highly unlikely, but whatever. Suppose this universe is the way it is. Is, are there any deeper questions we still want to understand? And I think you've got two options here. You have a whole bunch of questions like, why is there a universe at all? Why is the universe the way it is rather than some other way? Why does the universe obey scientific laws at all rather than just being a collection of events with no patterns at all? Why is there a universe in which life can exist when we have so, so many examples of universe where, universes where it couldn't? What do we do with those questions? And they're not scientific questions because science can't answer them. What do we do with them? We either say science is it, we throw them out, we try and, um, you know, you, you could call that naturalism. Sean Carroll calls that naturalism. I think that's his book right there. Um, 
you you either say these are not the questions we could ever get an answer to. Um, we certainly can't get a scientific answer, and so we can't get any answer. Or you know, whatever reason you have for that. Or the other option is let's look at the sort of things that might be able to explain it. And the the theistic um, answer is the fine tuning argument tries to say that. Um, there is the possibility of a better explanation. Whether it cries out for explanation, I think, is an unhelpful phrase, actually. Uh, but there's the possibility of not just saying this is the way it is, but it's the way it is for a certain reason. And if that can actually do some explanatory work for us, um, perhaps not in terms of calculation, um, but in terms of rendering something that we know to be true to be more likely than it would otherwise be, because probabilities change as a function of the hypothesis that you're assuming, that's an important point, uh, then then we've got a reason there to think that those deeper questions have answers. Do you... Is that something that interests you, Sabina, these these deeper questions? I mean, there is there is a sort of boundary point at which you can come to conclusions scientifically. Um, do you feel compelled in any way to go beyond that and to start asking those deeper philosophical questions about why there is a universe, whether the laws of nature are ultimately everything that exists or actually whether they, they too need an explanation and so on? If you ask me personally, no. It's just not what I want to do with my life. It doesn't interest me very much. <laughs> uh, my my shtick is more to try to <laughs> tell physicists when they cross the border uh, from science to philosophy or religion. And, uh, you know, if, if Luke says um, that's, that's not a scientific question, it's a philosophical question, it still, it still wants an answer. Um, these questions should be asked. Um, people should try to answer them, maybe by using different modes of explanation. That's all fine with me. Uh, I just don't want this to be conflated with scientific explanations. Because I'm very concerned, and that's what my whole book is about, um, that um, this leads scientists into a dead end, basically, where uh, they're trying to solve problems that don't exist. And that's pretty much what has happened uh, in particle g physics. I mean, you, just just elaborate on that just a little bit, Sabina, because your book, uh, as I mentioned, it's called Lost in Math. How Beauty Leads Physics Astray. You think that there's been too much of an emphasis on this idea of finding the beautiful solution, uh, you know, the, the, something that looks wonderful. Um, you think physics is just more messy than that. And, and are too many physics, physicists being led astray into a kind of metaphysical kind of sense of there has to be some uh, underlying structure, uh, you know, that goes beyond just the physics of the universe? Well, the problem is that... They are making metaphysical arguments, but don't know it. They're not, they're not aware of what they're doing. So they're confusing the science uh, with the philosophy. Um, so in particular, and you, you, you will notice this if you read the book, because I've interviewed quite a few people. Um, they think these are just mathematical arguments, uh, and they don't realize that there's actually quite a bit of <laughs> metaphysics behind uh, believing that this is something that even requires an explanation. And at least for particle physics, it ha has not worked. It just hasn't worked. Uh, they, they've tried to use these arguments over and over again. And it's a very similar story to the, as I said, to the fine tuning cosmology, though with a slightly different twist, uh, for exactly what you're varying over and, and, and so on. I, I don't really want to go into this. Uh, but, but the, there too, the argument is basically, well, you know, there's some kind of constant that requires an explanation. And then we have come up with an explanation for that. You know, there's this new particle or uh, I don't know, new field or we, we need supersymmetry and additional symmetry unification, all that kind of uh, stuff. And these hypotheses turned out to be wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong. It's just been a dramatically unsuccessful strategy. And the point that I'm trying to get across, well, that's because you didn't ask a scientific question in the first place. And so this is why, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to stop people from asking these questions. That's all fine with me. I want them to be aware that this is not a scientific strategy. It's not a scientific methodology. I'll come back to you for some comments on that in a moment's time, Luke. We're heading into our final break. We're talking about the fine tuning of the universe 
Uh, was the cosmos made for us on uh, the big conversation from Unbelievable today? I'm Justin Briley. My guests are Luke Barnes and Sabina Hossenfelder. In the United Kingdom just today, we passed 100,000 people who've been killed by the virus. I'm not the one here who is claiming that this is being supervised, that somebody is watching this, somebody knows that this is occurring, and somebody's allowing it to occur. We're in no position to say definitively there is no morally justifiable reason for this particular evil because we need a godlike perspective on all of space and all of time in order to make that claim. Such an interesting conversation on the fine-tuning of the cosmos today on The Big Conversation. Uh, Sabina Hossenfelder is a theoretical physicist researching dark matter at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies and author of Lost in Math, How Beauty Leads Physics Astray. I'll make sure there are links to Sabina and her very popular YouTube channel as well uh, with today's show. Uh, also to Luke Barnes, uh, who's our Christian guest on the show. He's an astrophysicist uh, researching things like galaxy formation, dark energy and the fine-tuning of the universe for life. Um, his book uh, on this particular subject is A Fortunate Universe, Life in a Finely Tuned Cosmos, uh, though the more recent book uh, is just behind you uh, on your video camera, Luke. It's uh, strategic. Just to give us the title of that and a very brief explanation of, of what you're doing in that new book. It's called The Cosmic Revolutionary's Handbook, or How to Beat the Big Bang. And um, so I'm sure Sabina's got some great stories about this as well. Ask any physicist, cosmologist, you get emails with people who say, I've got the final theory of everything. <laughs> uh, here it is. And all we wanted to do was just say, all right, if you, if you want to do that, here's how to do it properly. For starters, here's the data that you haven't bothered looking up to, you know, to actually explain. Uh, and here's why we do things like peer review and, and publishing and, and those sorts of things. So it's, it's a tour of the universe under the guise of here are the most important facts that led us to the way we think the universe is. And if you want to do better, here's how to do it. Fantastic. Um, I'll make sure there's links as well to you as well, Luke. I mean, in that last segment, we, we sort of heard Sabina again saying she thinks too many scientists are ending up asking unscientific questions, questions that are more metaphysical, that are, are more about finding some kind of purported beauty in the equations and in the underlying structure and so on. Um, I mean, is the same true? Could the same be argued for the, for the fine tuning sort of arguments that you're making? You're attempting to ask basically an unscientific question about some scientific parameters, essentially. Well, the reason I sort of said before that these are not scientific questions is, is because of what they're about. I mean, these are not theories about how the universe works. And so, you know, by stipulation, then they're not scientific theories. But I want to make a, a, a I think there's something that needs to be clarified here. There's the fine tuning argument. And I said that wasn't scientific just because of what it's trying to explain things in terms of God is not a physical thing. The idea of God is not the idea of a physical thing. And so it can't be a scientific theory. Um, but uh, I, I don't actually think um, uh, that fine tuning as it's applied in physics is necessarily a philosophical uh, belief. I, I think starting from the sort of Bayesian framework, there is a way, there has to be a way of saying, all right, I've got two theories, which one is the best? And one way of thinking about that is which one makes the most assumptions to, to you know, if you're just counting assumptions or the most implausible assumption, or which, you know, has the most internal flexibility. And I think the, the, the Bayesian approach has the best way of doing that. And that that is, is a scientific question because we're trying to appraise scientific theories. However, I don't want to say I'm an astrophysicist. I don't want to say that everything that particle physicists have done in applying a fine tuning or a related idea called naturalness is fine. So, so actually a lot of Sabina's critiques of that I, I can be on board with. And in particular, th this matters because we're building billion dollar machines to try and test these ideas is, is a very good reason to think very hard about what we think we're doing. So, so I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that they're purely philosophical, uh, but, um, I don't, I don't want to just endorse them either. There, there are ways to do that sort of reasoning wrong. And when it comes to how you kind of move from the fine tuning to the belief in a, in a creator God. Now, as you've said yourself, you're, you're not saying 
God is the outcome of this. Is it more that you're, are you doing a philosophical journey there of saying, well, given this phenomenon of fine tuning, which you believe obviously against Sabina is a valid sort of idea phenomenon. Um, but given that, does it fit better with the view that there is potentially a creator behind the universe or that we're living in a naturalistic universe that, that all that exists is the physical stuff of the universe? Is it simply that you're saying if, if you had to choose between the two options, you think it's more consistent with, with the idea of a God? Yeah, so um, I mean, I've 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 tried to understand what the naturalists say when they say, you know, Sh Sean and Sabina, Sean Carroll, Sabina, saying these questions. Feel free to ask them, but there's 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 nothing we can do to to know whether any answer to them is better than any other answer. I I, I do think we can do better than that, which is what fine tuning is is doing. These are metaphysical questions. These are philosophical questions. But I don't think that means that we're not allowed to ask them, or that we shouldn't ask them, or that we can just go you know, this is the way the universe is, deal with it. I think it's a it's a basic principle, not just of science, but of rationality, to try and put together the, the your worldview in a way that explains the most with the least assumptions. And I think what fine tuning shows is that just assuming that our universe is going to be life permitting, um, uh, if you want to put it that way, is, is a big assumption. It, or to put it another way, there is something remarkable and rare about the way that our universe is in that it, it, it permits life yeah i mean uh again i i can kind of predict where you're going to go with this sabina i suppose but but uh asking that kind of that next level question um d d i mean you you've said at the beginning you're you're kind of i think did you describe yourself as essentially atheist or agnostic um does that sort of does that impact the way you approach if you like the outcomes of your science do, do you think in a sense that you're you're you know, you're you're going to assume that there's no nothing else going on beyond the physical science because you've got you haven't been given any reason to believe in God. Is 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 that fair to say? I I I really don't think that it matters at all for my research. Just you know, practically the way the the things that I do, the calculations that I do, it plays absolutely no role. Uh, I also don't think that it has much of an influence um, on, you know, the more philosophical questions that I've been asking, that I've been writing about, that I've been discussing. Uh, but I have noticed a few times that um, when I talk to scientists, physicists mostly, <laughs> admittedly, uh, who are openly religious, um, as opposed to those who dis would describe themselves uh, as uh, atheists, uh, then the religious ones are the ones who are more careful about uh, distinguishing between their belief-based interests and their metaphysical assumptions and so on than the ones who kind of think they're, they're above it, right? Because they're not religious. So that's just you know, an, an observation that I have made. But I guess to what uh, Luke just said, um, I, 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 I would say probably the predictable thing, if you say there's something remarkable about it, there's something rare about it, I would say that these are just things that you can't quantify. Um, it's not a scientific statement. I have no doubt that you feel about it this way, and probably a lot of people uh, do it, but I wouldn't know how to phrase it uh, scientifically, and that's something uh, that that I just can't work with. Um, I I also, especially this issue about the rarity. I I ha I would have no idea how to even quantify something like this. Like if you say, well, you know, the universe could have been anyway, but let's just assume that it can be described by mathematics, just so we have some place to start with. Then you have what Max Tegmark called the mathematical universe. You know, there are all these possible mathematical structures. And the ones that we observe to describe our universe uh, is an infinitesimally small part of that. So, and, and how much do you know about how likely something like life, which we can't even agree on what it is, uh, is anywhere in this mathematical universe? We have absolutely no idea. I'm not even sure that that's a question which, to which the answer can even be quantified. So it's just something that I I can't make any sense of. 
I mean, one of the phrases Luke used earlier, which I thought was quite interesting, was the question is whether you think there are good questions outside of science in a way. And now you've said that obviously for your research, you don't need to be asking anything other than purely scientific questions. And that's totally understandable. Um, but are you interested yourself in questions beyond science? I mean, do, do you um, is it is it a valid question to be asking in the first place? Um, you know, is there something beyond the universe that explains the universe? Or do you think that the only kinds of questions we should be asking are those purely scientific questions? Um, well, I, certainly I do have non-scientific questions, like, for example, how do I fill in my stupid text forms? <laughs> right? Uh, but... Uh, uh, I mean, and, and, and certainly there, there are more philosophical questions that I'm interested in, though I have to admit that's mostly to the extent that I think maybe one day they might become scientific questions. <laughs> so I, I, I'm afraid I'm very much the scientist. So yeah, maybe since I know we're nearing the end, uh, maybe that's a point uh, worth emphasizing. There have certainly been uh, scientific uh, philosophical questions in the past that at some point turned into scientific questions like uh, the cosmological principle, for example, since we're already talking about um, cosmology, that's something that um, scientists have found a way to approach, actually ask the question, uh, you know, how how uniformly distributed are, is matter, stars, uh, galaxies actually uh, in the universe, is something that was once considered to be a philosophical uh, principle. And uh, now we have you know, a lot of this research about consciousness, that's something which was uh, not a too long time ago uh, in the in the field of philosophy, but now it's more and more turning into a scientific discipline. And um, maybe there are other areas where this will also happen. What about you, Luke? Do you, do you approve of the, the overlap? Uh, you know, do you think you have to go get philosophical at some point when you, I suppose, reach the boundaries of, of what science can tell you? I think, the, for me, the difference between science and philosophy is what it's trying to understand, rather than any. I I think there is, a, you know, epistemology, the, the theory of how we know things, how we know anything. I I think once you've got a firm epistemology, you can then aim that to try and understand the world, and in terms of the world, and that's science. Um, or if if there's a, a hypothesis which is not about the physical world around us. We could aim our say the same epistemology, you know, asking good questions and logic and pulling together the information we have and Bayesian probabilities and and all that sort of stuff. And we can aim them at those questions as well. And so for me, it's not that. So uh, I would I, would, I I I disagree that science becomes philosophy, but never mind that. That, that might just be worrying about words. But if for me, there's sort of a, a, a coherent and integrated whole there. It's not that. Um, you know, saying a, a, a saying a question is unscientific is just to say what it's aimed at trying to understand, rather than any sort of um, uh, you, know, you know rejection of that idea. It's it's not a it's not a put down. There are yeah. questions that try to be scientific but fail, so unfalsifiable scientific theories. But that's another issue. Sure, sure. It's it's been really interesting having you both on to discuss these questions. Um, uh, I, I suppose I'd be interested just just as we begin to wrap things up, Sabina. Um, you, you've said, you know, from the outset that the kind of the God question just doesn't particularly interest you. Um, you're interested in the science and you don't think you'll ever the science could ever provide any kind of evidence for for the God question. That's a kind of separate um, sphere, I suppose, you know the non-overlapping magisteria, as, as some uh, philosophers and scientists have put it. But um, obviously, you know, as I said at the beginning, you you, you are a multifaceted person. Uh, you enjoy the singing, you enjoy, you know, the relationships and, and everything else. And, um, and when I looked at some of your videos, you know, they are, you know, in a sense, asking big questions about life and love and meaning and purpose and that kind of thing. Uh, so in that sense, um, it, it strikes me, you, you 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 go beyond the science in some areas of your life you you do sort of in a sense those kinds of questions presumably you don't think have scientific answers when you put a video together a music video you're not particularly necessarily just thinking about 
how will you know what 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 is the scientific aspect of this you're you're looking to engage someone emotionally uh, and everything else in that so so in that sense um i i i just I, i'm just interested to know do you do you think there's a a different part of your personality that would be open to the god question or do you think that's a sort of uh you, you don't just you just don't have to go there in that sense oh well i'm certainly open to the god question i just don't really see that there's any interesting information coming in anytime soon i guess uh I would, uh, I, I've been a little confused by what you just said about, uh, you know, will, will science ever provide evidence for God does something like this? Uh, so I guess if that happened, then I would no longer consider it to be a religious God. So I, so I guess I kind of uh, really think of these things as two non overlapping, uh, areas. Um, yeah, I, I does that suffice yeah. as an explanation? <laughs> no, I, I I understand what you're saying. I, I suppose I, I suppose what, what what you're saying is if if someone did present some scientific evidence for for God, then it wouldn't be the God as you understand God to be defined because it would become part of the natural world. It would become something you could, you know, physically exactly. sort of in, investigate. Uh, that that's a very fair point. I, I suppose what I I would be interested to know is if could you imagine what sort of type of evidence it would be then if it's not scientific if it was something else that would would draw you towards that belief i mean i'm asking you a hypothetical here obviously but could, could you imagine what sort of thing you would need to to entertain the idea at least that there that there's a god behind everything not really no i can't think of anything you don't you don't know what what that would be well that's fair enough because you know i suppose me, most of the time we don't know what something is until it's presented to us as uh, in that way Luke, um, do you think people kind of have to start out with a religious inclination to see fine tuning as potentially evidence for God? Or, I mean, you've, you've, you 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 co authored this book with your your atheist colleague Geraint Lewis. Um, I, I'm just wondering, you know, when when we come to these questions, whether the the worldview we bring with us inevitably informs the way we're going to interpret the evidence and you know, you did come to this question as a Christian. And so is, is it natural then to say, well, of course, you're going to say, you know, there's a potential divine explanation for this, whereas an atheist like Durant and indeed Sabina is going to say, no, I don't think we need to go in that direction. Well, I, I love there's a story told by Alistair McGrath, uh, who said he, he'd given, he'd, he'd given a, a presentation which involved just discussing the basics of fine tuning as I presented them before. And someone in the audience talked to him afterwards and said, it's one of my favourite quotes about fine-tuning, actually, I'm not religious, but something weird is going on here. <laughs> uh, I think, um, you know, Hoyle's point that, you know, he was an atheist and yet this sort of took him aback a bit does say that there is something there. Now, maybe after all said and done, you, you, you know, that, that initial reaction you then analyse, and when Sabina does that, she doesn't see the numbers she needs, so... She, so no further. Um, I, I think you can get the. I've got a paper in a in a philosophical journal called A Reasonable Little Question. If you want to see my attempts to put some numbers on it, maybe it's not convincing. But I, I do think, you know, you, you try not to just confirmation bias is one is really hard to avoid. It's really hard not to just read all the books that you agree with already, and uh, just have a wonderful time agreeing with all these people who already agree with you. And so um, I think fine-tuning, you know, it does fit into my worldview nicely. I, I, uh, I think it doesn't fit into naturalism but that's a, 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 as nicely, but that's a point of contention. But I think, I mean, just you know, the important thing for me that I keep trying to do is to read not only people who are atheists or who don't believe in God or agnostics who criticise fine-tuning, but the ones who then point out the stuff about our universe, which doesn't look so nice and wonderful and lovely, like evil and suffering and all that sort of stuff. So I, th I think, I mean, fine tuning, whatever it is, it's only one piece of the puzzle. It might be a very small piece uh, as we try to think through these big issues. So uh, for me, it's been, you know, I've had a, pol I had a policy last year that for every two audio books, every three audio books, one of them I had to disagree with <laughs> from the start. <laughs> that I read through and I've been trying to do that. It was a very challenging yeah. year, but I think that's what we, sure. you, you've got to try and yeah. do. 
Well, uh, either way, it's been great having you both on the show. Um, and and Sabina, I, I, I guess ultimately, even though you, you obviously don't see any evidence for God or from the science and so on, you're, you're still, as you said at the outset, you, you find the fact that we can be sitting here discussing these ideas, uh, you know, doing particle physics, pretty amazing in and of itself. That That at least perhaps we can all agree on, right? Great. Well, look, it's been wonderful having you both on the show. Thank you very much for taking the time. And uh, I will make sure there are links uh, with today's program where people can find out more about you. Uh, but for now, uh, Luke and Sabina, thanks for being with me today. Thank, Thank you. you. I hope you enjoyed today's big conversation from Unbelievable. What did you think of the discussion? I'd love you to tell me by filling out a brief survey. It's multi-choice and really quick. You can also receive bonus video content and updates from the series by subscribing to our newsletter at thebigconversation.show. Links for both the survey and the bonus video content are with today's video. Thanks for watching and see you soon.